ask you to go. Thank you. Yeah. We don't make it easy. <laughs> Good morning, Jennifer, and Good welcome morning. to Chicago. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Sure. So everybody knows, um, you know, we've been we've been hammering relentlessly on this theme of reinvention, which is fascinating to all of us as business people and as people. And uh, so I have two goals for our conversation. One is Apple Pay has been a part of the reinvention of, of an industry, of the payments industry. And it's been part of the reinvention of Apple, um, which is no trivial thing. <laughs> so let's, let's start with going back four years ago. You, you introduced this, this really delightful product that anybody with an iPhone could use called Apple Pay. Mm -hmm. But there was one problem. It worked great, but it didn't work very many places. Um, tell everybody. First of all, the genesis for doing the product in the first place, and then the challenge of launching a product that couldn't be in wide distribution yet. Yeah. So when, when we thought about Apple Pay, uh, we really thought broadly about wanting to do services that replace the wallet. And we wanted to start with payments. Payments is something that people do every day. Uh, you know, it's, it's a constant part of your life. Uh, so we created this, as you said, a great product, a great service. Um, and as some of you may know, in the United States, the payments industry is a bit further behind from a technology perspective than other countries. So our contactless or paying in store in terms of the technology we used was not as well accepted. So we've spent quite a bit of time growing that acceptance footprint. We think this year we'll end at 60% of the locations, retail locations in the US accepting Apple Pay and contactless. And that's really getting up to the levels now that you see in many countries outside the US. So places like the UK, uh, even places like uh, Russia, uh, Canada. Um, we just launched in Brazil. So Apple Pay is in 24 countries now. Uh, and we have a great acceptance footprint on a global basis. Without meaning to be um, snarky at all, I mean that. I mean that. Why? Is the United, why is the United States behind on contactless payments? Or, or is it just payments? I, I, I want to be clear on that. Yeah, I think it, well, it's actually payments in general. When you think about the chip technology, as you know, many of you just have re probably received new chip cards in the last year, and you're starting to use those in many of the machines. The US was one of the last countries to move to the chip technology, which is more secure. Um, and part of the reason is because the US is less regulated in this space. And so many uh, countries, I think, mandated the move to chip technology from a regulatory standpoint. Uh, the US has not. And so we were a bit slower to move. And of course, we're a huge market with many, many uh, players uh, who bring together the whole payments ecosystem. You said something interesting when you said that Apple um, wanted to reinvent the wallet. You started with payments. Yeah. You called it Apple Pay, and that was the all of the um, uh, the focus was on pay. What did you mean by we wanted to start with payments? Well, if you look at um, some of the things that we're working on now in terms of replacing the wall, we're also uh, doing things like transit. So today, in 12 uh, metro cities across the world, you can use your Apple uh, your Apple Wallet with Apple Pay technology to go through transit stations. Uh, in places like Tokyo, Beijing, and Shanghai, we do what's closed loop. We support the proprietary cards. I think the proprietary card here is called Ventra in Chicago. Uh, but there are many other metros, like Chicago, actually, London, uh, Moscow, um, that use open loop technology. So you can tap using your Apple Wallet, using Apple Pay cards, with a regular credit or debit card to take transit. Uh, in fact, in Chicago, they just, with this open loop technology, they just started supporting transfers. So you can tap into the subway and then transfer to the bus, tap into the bus on a single fare using your phone. Uh, and you don't have to have, you just ha can use your normal Master Visa, MasterCard Visa, Amex, or Discover. Could I just see a quick show of hands for how many people in the room use Apple Pay or, or a competitor to Apple Pay regularly? Yay. So this is this is a good audience this is a great uh, for audience. you. And Thank it, you. Would it be uh, uh, just another show of hands for things like uh, boarding passes or tickets? Yeah. How many people do that? Yeah. Okay, so not. I mean, you know, seventy percent by my by my read, which is above average, I assume. What what do you think the penetration is in the general population? Uh, it varies a lot by country uh -huh. uh, in terms of uh, the different usage. Again, in transit. So if you go into Tokyo today, we have a really high penetration of. Uh, iPhone customers who are using uh, Tokyo Transit. Uh, again, varies. Some people use Apple Pay more in-store versus online. 
Um, uh, so very, it varies quite a bit, but we see great penetration, and once customers get active, they absolutely love it. So, and I, I want to go there. It's, you know, I've told you, I love it. And, you know, I give myself permission to love something at Apple and to also say, you know, I don't wear an Apple watch, for example. So I'm, I, I pick and choose, and <laughs> I love this technology. We're work I, on that. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. I have my reasons. That's for another panel, right? Um, but, you know, I think it's so good, and, and, and not just the pay, but the wallet that I want I want everything to be in, in the Apple wallet or, or, or Google or whatever, or one of your competitors. I want, it, I want to stop carrying a wallet. How soon is that? How far away is that? Well, I think it's a good journey. I can tell you some <laughs> of the other. Not um, tomorrow is what you're saying. Not tomorrow. But we are working on some really other interesting areas in the wallet. You mentioned boarding passes. We've had great success there. Uh, just this next week, we're rolling out with a number of universities. They're beginning to launch student IDs in the Apple Wallet. So Duke, University of Oklahoma, University of Alabama will enable their students to be able to put their student ID cards in Apple Wallet. So if you think about a student's life, you know, I'm tapping into my dorm, I'm tapping in to pay for my food, I tap in to pay for the laundry, sometimes I have to tap in for, uh, for attendance, you know, at class. And they'll all be able to do that now on their um, Apple iPhones or on their Apple Watches. And we think that's a, that's a tremendous you know, um, new area for us to focus in, which is really access. We're also along those lines. Today already in about 50 major uh, stadiums across the US, um, you know, MLB, and, uh, uh, National Football League, basketball, NBA, those, there's about 50 stadiums that already accept Apple Pay inside concessions. But now what we're doing is we're working with them to begin to enable contactless tickets for access. So you can, as a season holder, as an example um, for the Giants, you can put that in your Apple wallet and you can tap to get through the gate. So all digital sort of from an end-to-end -end experience. So in it, also in the Washington Nationals, they're beginning to roll this out as well. So you can start to see over time as we work with the ecosystem of these various areas, whether it's stadiums or transit operators, um, how do we begin to integrate those so they can use the technology to eliminate the physical uh, implementation of cards or access? I think most people in this room have a, have a card that they use to get into their office every day. Yeah. At Apple, how do you get into your, <laughs> into your building and into your office? Good question. Well, with Apple Park, which is our new, our new building, we do have Apple uh, passes, which are in a wallet. So you can com go completely digital there as well. You can, but you, you can also use an ID the, the traditional you way. Can, you, we still have badges. Um, and, and if you, not all of the buildings at Apple yet are update, upgraded mm. to be able to support the new, mm. the new badges, but we do have the ability to do Apple Passes into Apple Park. Is, is getting into this corporate market an aspiration? I mean, that's a, I would guess that's a big market. Sure, there's actually a number of areas you can think about that we can extend this type of technology. Hospitality, hotel rooms is definitely one. Um, versus being issued a card yeah. you know, at the check-in, you could have that. You could check in via the app and you could get a digital issuance of a, of a hotel room key as an example. Also corporate access is an interesting one. Um, that requires us to integrate with a number of access providers who provide all sorts of different levels of security and authorization uh, types of solutions for corporates. Uh, but it's a def definitely an interesting case for the future. So I want to wonk out on a couple topics. First, technology. Um, Apple Pay uses something called NFC, near field communication. Uh, WeChat in China is, is based on the, the QR code. Okay, yeah. At a high level, what's the difference? Does it matter that they're doing something different from what you're doing, and so on? Yeah, well, we, when we started on this journey um, in payments, we we chose the technology that we thought provided the best customer experience as well as the most security. Uh, and that's a, you know, we really, if you look at Apple Pay and the way it's architected without getting to all the, I like to say the sausage making, it really is the most secure way to pay. You're saying it's more secure, secure than a QR code? More secure than a QR code and it's more secure certainly than uh, any type of physical card. Uh -huh. uh, you know, you have, to, you, have to buy, you have to authenticate using face ID or touch ID to be able to use it. We have, um, the credentials are tokens, they're not your actual card number. Those are stored in a special hardware place uh, on the phone called the secure element. And there's a dynamic code that goes with every payment to authorize that it is indeed coming from that device. So there's a lot of security there. Um, I think in, in, 
in other countries, developing countries, the QR code's been um, actually tremendously successful. And one of the reasons it's been very successful is it's very low cost for merchants to accept. Um, the readers are not expensive, and then in some cases they do what's called a merchant presented QR code. You see this a lot in India where they print a QR code, they paste it up on their store, and you scan it with your phone and you pay. That's definitely not the most secure way to pay, but certainly in developing markets, it's, it's certainly interesting and popular. Um, you see, though, in most developing mar markets, contactless is the dominant uh, technology for point of sale payments, uh, and we, we would expect that to continue to grow. Um, briefly, wha what's the hang up with restaurants and gas stations? <laughs> yes. Um, well, in, again, in um, gas stations, uh, it's very expensive to upgrade those pumps to NFC contactless technology. Uh, they have a mandate to do so, I think it's now in 2020, uh, from, a, from a liability shift perspective. Uh, so we'll see more and more of that, but some of the gas stations are doing actually really great uh, innovative things with their apps where you can use, uh, you can drive up to a station, you can put the number in your app of the pump you're at, and you can pay with Apple Pay, pre-authorize, and all authorizes through the cloud and down to the mm -hmm. pump. Really great, particularly in cold weather climates like this one in the yeah. winter where you don't really want to get out of your car did and stand there and plug your, you know, do all that, so. Did you ever think in your Silicon Valley career that you would become such an expert on gas stations? <laughs> no, no, definitely not. <laughs> in restaurants, any hope yeah. there? Yeah, in, in Europe, what you see, yeah. uh, what you see in Europe, if you you travel, is they carry the contactless terminal to the table, so you can tap at the terminal. Again, much more secure uh, than giving your card to someone and having them, you know, take it uh, behind the counter to do it. So we do see that. We also see uh, more if you look at fat, what we call fast casual restaurants, places like Chili's and Olive Garden. They all are uh, enabling Apple Pay at the table. Um, before we open it up, um, explain to the room the economics of Apple Pay, what you do make money on and what you don't make money on and why. Well, we do have a business model with Apple Pay, but we don't really go into the details, so I can't really answer that question fully. Um, there are certain parts, of certainly, of uh, what we have with Apple Wallet, which are... Um, don't have economics associated with them, and there are parts of the services that we do provide uh, for the partners primarily that do. And in all cases, there's no consumer-oriented fees, so consumers are not charged for using Apple Pay uh, or for using um, our transit or access uh, types of solutions or boarding passes, as you're all familiar. Yeah. I mean, it's no secret that you, you take a VIG on credit card transactions for facilitating the transaction, right? You're not saying how much, but you do take a, a fee. Perhaps, yes. Perhaps, okay. <laughs> I, I've, I've read that widely. But the point I want to be sure everybody understands, the boarding passes, you're never going to make money on that. That's about making people love their iPhones, correct? Well, I think it's all actually about making people love their iPhones. That is what, what, why we are doing what we do. Uh, and if you think about, again, all the things that you do every day with your wallet, um, who doesn't not want to do that on their phone or on their watch? Really, in the future, you can't even imagine needing to do these things with a physical, uh, in most cases, less secure uh, type of instrument. So the experiences are fantastic. Um, one thing we also didn't talk about was loyalty. Mm -hmm. uh, so we are also doing loyalty. I mean, a number of you probably belong to loyalty programs at point of sale. Walgreens has been a longtime partner of ours. You can put your Walgreens Pass, Coca-Cola. Uh, we also launched with Woolworths in Australia, which is one of the largest uh, big box retailers there. Uh, they are thrilled with the results. They overachieved their forecast in terms of passes added to wallet, uh, a year-long forecast in actually two weeks. Hmm. So their customers were really excited. Uh, and then I'm happy to say that we're also going to be launching uh, in Japan with Lawson, which is one of the largest convenience store retailers there. They have a huge... Uh, points program called Ponta. They'll be adding their uh, uh, loyalty cards to Wallet as well. So really across the board, if you look at loyalty, transit, uh, access, obviously payments, um, not only general payments, but store card payments, uh, we're really beginning to tackle a number of those things and, and develop a capability so you really can leave your wallet at home. Great. Alan? I'm no expert in this area, so please uh, un uh, take this question in stride. But it seems like the big opportunity here is 
to disrupt the credit card industry, replace the credit card industry and all the costs involved in credit cards. And, and that's in China, there are no credit cards, right? They're just doing uh, uh, payments. Uh, direct to WeChat. D direct to we yeah. re WeChat. So can you talk a little bit about why Apple made the decision to sort of entrench the credit card industry rather than disrupt the credit card industry? Sure. Um, so, so first, let me uh, maybe correct a couple of things. So there are actually uh, a lot of credit and debit cards in China. It's actually, I think, the largest market in terms of issued uh, uh, cards, yes. Um, so there are quite a bit, quite a bit there. Um, I, I would say, so you know, when, when we think about how we approach a market, we really think about consumer. We think about our customers. What do customers want to do? And so when we thought about Apple Pay, we thought, um, there are a lot of payments out there that our customers already love and trust. And you know what? It happens to be their debit and credit card, and it happens to be the payments associated with their, with their banks. And so, again, since we're, we, we don't sit around and think about, like, oh, what industry should we disrupt? We think about what great customer experiences can we develop. That, that's our perspective. And so uh, that's why we developed, I think, the uh, platform today, which is largely based on debit and credit, but is, but is open to a variety of payments. Uh, as you can see from what we're doing with access and transit, which are actually, in some cases, special form of payments. Hmm. So, so it's, it's a broad platform that can support, but uh, we did it because that's how customers like to pay, particularly in the US and in the Western markets where we sell uh, the most of our, you know, many, many of our devices. And you don't have a bank charter, is that correct? Absolutely not, yes. And, and, and no. so it, it, <laughs> that would mean we would be regulated. <laughs> yeah, and so if I could reinterpret what you said. We don't it, want to be regulated. If yeah. you had seen a way to do what was right for your customers that, uh, that eliminated credit cards or, and debit cards, you would have done it, but you didn't. Is that, is that a fair statement? No, no, again, I would say if you ask, you know, everyone in this room probably has a favorite, you know, card, you know, for whatever reason, because they get great reports or they get great points or whatever it may be. And it's different in different countries. The reasons are different in different countries. Um, and we looked at this, we said, people already are paying with these. Why can't we figure out a way to create that experience on our devices in a more secure way? So it really went to understanding what consumers wanted to do and uh, making that available. Jennifer, qu uh, quick last question, which is, um, you spent a bunch of years at Netscape. I did, yes. That was <laughs> and, a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and you've, now you've been at Apple yeah. for a long time. Netscape yeah. was an iconic company that did not stand the test of time. Apple is an iconic company that has stood the test of time so far for a long time. Very briefly, what's the diff what has been the difference in your experience? Wow, that's a great question. Um, you know, Netscape was at the beginning, as you know, the beginning of the commercialization of the internet. And um, I think we, we had a tremendous set of services, tremendous product, uh, but the competition there was very different, right? And free is hard to compete with when you're a startup. Um, so I think our business, we didn't have the right business model, um, honestly, it was more challenging. Obviously, Apple, very different company, uh, as you like to say, continually reinvents uh, ourselves. We're focused on great consumer um, experiences, great products. Uh, and with that uh, continual innovation, I think, uh, and the right business model uh, in terms of the device business that we have, as well as the services businesses that we have, uh, makes it a very, very different company. Well, so. you, you've given us a great, a great window into all of that. So thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you. Great to see you.